talk to you today about a stone to sit on. Um, Joshua 4 and 20 says this, and there was at Gilgal, hold on a second, we've got a, just talk amongst yourselves. Okay, there we go. It says this, Joshua 4.20, for all my former pot smokers out there. It was there at Gilgal that Joshua piled up the 12 stones taken from the Jordan River. Then Joshua said to the Israelites, in the future, your children will ask, what do these stones mean? What's up with the stones? Why do you guys care so much about the stones? Then you can tell them, this is where the Israelites crossed Jordan on dry ground. The Lord rolled back the waters of the Jordan in a miracle fashion, and they walked across on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the river right before your eyes, and he kept it dry. How many of you know he can keep you dry? He can, he can do the miracle, and he can see it through. He'll keep it dry until you were all across, just as he did at the Red Sea when he dried it up until we had crossed over. He did this so all the nations of the earth might know that the Lord's hand is powerful. And so you might fear the Lord, your God, forever. Stones. The stones matter. The stones were symbolic of God's ability to see his people through. If you started with Jesus, know that he can see it through. And, and, and it's important that you have memorial stone moments in your life where you realize if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, I would not have made, that, made it through that difficult season. This morning as the man of God was showering and shaving, Brother Marvin Sapp came on my little portable Bluetooth that I put in the shower with me. And he sang a song, and I'd like to sing it to you right now. It goes, never would have made it, never would have made it without you. I would have lost it all. But now I see you were there for me. And while I had my armpits full of soap, I lifted those hands high. And it created a wonderful aroma of soapy splendor in the presence of God. Come on, somebody. I never would have made it without God. That's the truth. So the title of the day is A Stone to Sit On. And this is not related theologically, but I'm just going to draw the dots together for my purpose is today in Matthew 28, 2, the Bible says, um, when Jesus was resurrected, it says, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. He rolled aside the stone and he sat on it. Now, those stories are loosely related, but the concept that I want you to understand is that we need to build stones for people to sit on. We need to make a way for people to have a way to get to God. We need to remind people that there is an answer in this city, and the answer is Jesus. Matthew, in that little section of scripture there, doesn't say the angel rolled the, rolled the stone out of the way so Jesus could get out in his glorified body. We know he was walking through walls and scaring people. It's there in the scriptures. But that stone was removed so the women and the disciples could enter the tomb and see that Jesus' body was gone. It was a stone rolled away that the angel sat on so others could see, a stone so others could see. I want us to be the kind of church that builds something significant so that generations in the future will drink from the spring that we dug from, that will remember the memorial stones we built in Springfield, in the Ozarks, here right now. And so this weekend, and the weekends coming are all about us having a heart to make a way for somebody else. To prepare a place for other people to know Jesus, right? We want to move the church forward. We want to build a legacy that lasts. We don't want generations behind us to forget about the goodness of God in us that we lived out and witnessed. I was having a conversation in the hallway uh, with a couple people before church today, and it hit me. One of the person one of the people I was talking to had children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren all in this church. There's a memorial process. There is a handing off. There is a continuation of the story of God in the generations. We want to see that widely shared in God's house. Come on, somebody say amen today. Amen. So the Bible gives us something about seating people. The Bible tells us in James about how to seat people. It says in James 2 and 2, 
For if a man wearing fine gold, a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, hey, you, how are you doing? You sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? The doors of God's house are open to everybody to come to the cross and experience the same grace, the same love, the same acceptance, and the same help that Jesus provides. Amen, somebody? Ah, what are some of the greatest movies in the last 30 years? Don't say Star Wars, this isn't your day. I'm going to submit something to you, and I want you just to consider it. It's an old movie. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe you haven't, but it's called Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. And there's a scene in the movie that I want to point out to you today. And because of YouTube, I can't share it very well, so I'm just going to tell you about it. Little Forrest, little Forrest, <clears throat> I got to work it. Jenna, Jenna, Jenna. Little, little Forrest had the leg braces on. He gets on the bus for the first time. Back in those days, the lady bus driver smoked a big cigarette and was like, get on, honey. Just like the chick in the Simpsons drives the bus. And Forrest gets on the bus, and he's trying to find a seat on the bus. And all the kids scoot over like, these seats taken. Which is Alabama or Mississippi, wherever that's, that was said. That was my Mississippi-Alabama accent. Hey, hi, hey, you, these seats taken. And he was dejected and he was broken and he wasn't sure where he fit as he got on that bus. I tell you right now, I am thankful I don't have to go to middle school cafeterias anymore and find a place to sit. Come on, somebody. It's hard for those kids out there. It is rough in those streets. But little Forrest was clumbering through the, the bus stop, the bus on the bus with his leg braces and nobody would let him see, sit. And then Jenny says, hi. Hey, Forrest, you can sit with me. He said, okay, Jenny. And he sat down with Jenny on the bus. Now, I submit to you, if he would have known all the drama Jenny was going to bring in his life, boy, boy would have sat in the back of the bus, just, just sat and stood in the back. Notice I said, boy, boy, because I listened to all that Cat Williams interview, folks. I listened to every bit of it. I believe most of it. If he would have known, he probably wouldn't have found a seat there. But James, James gave us a different scenario. It was of a wealthy man coming into a church, and because of his wealth, he was treated a certain way, a certain seat, and an obviously poor man gets a, an offer to stand in the corner or sit on the floor. Like the heart of God's house is that everybody gets the same welcome. It's the power of a seat. It's a power of a place prepared. It's a power of thinking about people before they ever get here. Just in leading a church, we think about everything people will experience and try to get as many folks engaged in welcoming people who are far from God into the life of God through the local church. And so we let it start in the parking lot. Now on a day like this, I'm giving everybody a hard pass. So if we didn't have parking lot people today, it is just how it's going to be. You're going to have to fight through it to find Jesus, all right? But typically, we'll, we'll be greeting you when you drive on the lot, and we'll be engaging you when you come in the door, and we'll be serving you when you get in the house because we want there to be no barrier for people to get close to Jesus. It's, it's in my guts. The heart of God's house is that everybody gets the same welcome. A seat says you're welcome. A seat prepared says your value. A seat prepared says we want you. We have thought about you. A seat says you have been thought of. You belong. And James is talking about the assembly. And it's a very simple definition of a church. And that is a public gathering of Christians to worship. It's, it's, it's the gathering of the church. And it's so, it's so, so important. Hebrews 10.25. I've said this a lot since covid but I'll say it again, Hebrews 10.25, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, 
but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And so the church and, 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 and being a part of the church is a hardcore expression of your committed ideology. And attending the church of Jesus Christ, whatever form it takes, whatever it looks like, as long as Christ is preached and the word of God is treated as the inspired mind, heart, and expression of God, if that's the case, then uh, God is pleased in that. But, but the days of the church, you know, in that, that, that gathering of the church, Jesus took a word for politics called ecclesia. And he, it was a Greek term for, for like a parliament coming together or, or a place where decisions were made and where, 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 where uh, a focus was given to, to making everything better. And he called the church the ecclesia, and, and that was a political assembly of citizens in ancient Greek states. And so we just, as a sidebar, politics have become spiritual and politics have become theological, they're teaching my kids in school things that I would never teach them. They're old enough that they won't listen, but not everybody's kids are old enough. I had kids learning about queer folk, uh, queer film in a, in a movie class. I had, I had uh, a substitute teachers teaching Marxism in English class. Like, what is going on? And so uh, the political bit of our world is become theological and spiritual. All the things in Genesis 1 through 5 that God has established, the wickedness in our society that masquerades as politics has a counterfeit. Can somebody say amen to that? It has a counterfeit. It has a counterfeit to God's order, has a counterfeit to God's creation, has a counterfeit to God's, has a, a, a counterfeit to everything that God set up in Genesis, okay? And so, the Bible says we got to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but we got to render unto God what is God's. Well, what is God's? Our worship is God's. And so when politics and when society and when Marxist values inhibit or work to inhibit the free exercise of our worship, that's when we have to say, this is out of bounds for you. You're out of your lane. The, 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 the government can restrain vice, but the church must share virtue. And when government tries to share virtue by restraining the church, then we have to speak up. And... We need to be thankful for the political climate thus far because we're gathering here without fear of, of reprisal, without fear of persecution, but that's not the case in North Korea today. It's not the case in China today. It's not the case in North Africa today. It's not the case in the Middle East today, and it's starting not to be the case in large parts of Europe. And when Paul says, don't forsake the church as some are doing, it reminds me that we ought not to be casual and dismissive about church when others around the world are risking their lives today just to go. It. It's cold outside, but I'm bringing the heat this morning. Like, like we... We ought not to be casual and dismissive about church when others around the world are risking their lives just to go. We get to sit here in a place prepared for us, in freedom to honor God, and I don't think we should treat casually what other Christians around the world are going to prison for. Feeling strong as horseradish today, amen? Like we have a privilege and I think it's our responsibility to build a place where people can encounter the only thing that matters, salvation for their souls. And because of this, praise God, the church is gaining importance and not losing it. We're gaining importance. Our voice is so radical. Our take on eternity is so different. Our, our method for living is so revolutionary. The church is gaining influence and gaining relevance in the darkness all around us more than maybe it has been in my lifetime. And the church will gain 
more importance. There is an importance in gathering for worship. This is where encouragement happens. This is where ideologies are formed. This is where convictions are, are shared from the word of God. This is where engagement with other believers happens. It's where strength comes. It's where darkness has to flee and where hurts are healed and purposes are found and marriages are restored. It happens in God's house. That's why we can't neglect God's house. And the church said, yeah. There's just nothing like the encouragement that God brings. Darkness gets pushed back. People find salvation. Freedom from addiction and bondage happens. It's in the house of God because there's nothing like the church of Jesus. And somebody says, amen. And so we create space for people to be forgiven of their sins, to get a new heart and a new mind. To, 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 to make things right with God. We provide that place. And we provide a place for all ages, especially kids. This right here, and I would sit in it, but the angles are super unflattering. <laughs> and the, the pictures of it would be just not great. This is a kid's chair, okay? This is a kid's chair, and it's so small, I can probably, yes, I can put it right, right here. Like, like... This is important. This is important in God's house. Like I learned about Jesus sitting in one of these. I heard about his power and his grace and his love and his mercy as I sat in one of these chairs. Did I embrace it right away? No, I was full of the devil, much like your kids. <laughs> but but the, the message of Jesus started penetrating the heart that I had of darkness, it started, it started causing my mind to see that there was truth of another world. That's why Matthew 19 and 4 says, 14, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for such belongs to the kingdom of heaven. We're going to build a chair for the next generation. We're going to build chairs for the next generation. There are plenty of forces in our society that want to tell kids who they are, what they are, what they should worship, and what they should follow. But the majority of it has nothing to do with God's plan. There needs to be a voice in our society for God's plan. And we're that voice. Like, we're going to clap, we're going to clap. We create, praise God. We purposefully and they give us nothing back. I'm telling you, the offerings that come from the kids, from the kids' areas, it's like a Jolly Rancher in three cents. They're not pulling their weight. They're never going to pull their weight. They're not supposed to pull their weight. But it is the, it's, I, I, I get emphatic and call everything the most important. But it's dang important that we give children a picture of Jesus. It is not child care. That's right. They're lifting little holy hands unto Jesus. When they don't have money, we teach them how to give so that the principles of the kingdom are in their soul. Like you, you need to bring your kids to church and you don't have to bring them in the big church. We got a little church that we have designed for them so they can know how good their God is, that he has created them and that he has truth that he delivers to us called the Bible. They lift their little holy hands and worship. Our Sea Kids area stewards what's important to God. If it was child care, I'd charge you for it. <laughs> it's not child care, it's church. Yeah. It's church. Two or three weeks ago in one service, we had 17 kids give their life to Christ. Do you understand? That if a child, the, 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 the chances of somebody giving their life to Christ post-17 go down dramatically? Like people have to be reached for Jesus when they're open to the message and they haven't hardened their heart in ideology. And so, if you think about God's call to Abraham, here's why God called Abraham. And this is why God calls churches as well. Genesis 18 and 19 says... About Abraham, for I have chosen him that he may command his children. I chose him because he's going he's to raise his family right. He's going to command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Abraham's a father of faith. 
God looked down and saw him and said, I'm going to give that guy the opportunity to be the father of faith because he'll raise up the next generation to honor me. I believe God raises up churches that will do the same. And so if we don't provide a seat for them, the world will. If we don't lead the next generation, the world will. If we don't disciple the next generation, they're going to tick-tock them to death. The world will. If we don't teach our kids, the world will. That's why we've got to have seats for kids and staffed and ready and built. And their offerings will never cover it. I believe the blessing of God by faith is on our church. Because we have chosen. My flexibility is in question. I'm just going to. There we go. So flexible. Like, like they, have, they have no skill. Like uh, we don't want them working the parking lot. They have no money to invest. They're immature and think boogers and farts are the funniest thing on the planet. And see, it doesn't go over here. But it goes over like crazy there if somebody gets loose and says it. <laughs> Investing in the next generation is a faith move. And if we'll take care and invest in God's children, God will invest and take care of us. So we're building a place for children. There's another place we're building, a place for people to sit. We're building a place for leaders. We're building places for leadership and development. This is the kind of chair you sit in when, 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 when you're being built to, to see the work of God through your hands and your feet being a ministry tool. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 and 12 this, uh, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God calls pastors and churches to lead and develop people. If you'll get involved in the church, it'll make you a better business person. If you'll get involved in the church, it'll make you a better leader. If you get involved in the church, it will train you. There are men in this church today who have million-dollar businesses who gained a lot of the skill they've got to do what they're doing based upon the fact that they served early and often, and God gave them grace to grow. I don't believe the greatest theologians are going to come out of some other place. I believe they'll come out of this house. I believe worshipers will come out of this house. I believe, I believe church builders and leaders will come from this house. Why? Because we will equip those people. Like, I'm doing all I'm going to do. It's going to be through the expansion of leaders in the house of God that have a heart and a mindset to pull on others to grow. When Babylon raided Israel during the time of Daniel, they took all the promising young kids and they put them in their language, in their schools, in their environment, and they took them away from Israel to build Babylon. And the world hasn't changed. The world wants to raise up our brightest and best to build Babylon. But I believe there's a church that says, we've got a seat for you. We've got a place for you. We prepared to help you grow as a leader. So I want to say your talent is wanted here. Like your talent is honored here. Your calling is important here. I met Katy Perry's dad one time. He dresses like a, uh, he's like, like a, uh, it was like, whoa, whoa. He, dress, uh, he dresses so unique that I said, hi, sir, who are you? He's like, well, I'm an evangelist, but I'm Katy Perry's dad. And I got, I got a little bit interested in Katy Perry for a while. And I read about it, and she tried to give her talent to the church, and somehow she was rejected along the way, or to the, the Christian music industries, which is a whole other thing. And, but, but at some point, she felt like there's not a place for me in the church. And by her own interview, she said she sold her soul. Hey! I don't want our kids to sell their soul to do something with what God has placed in them. I believe the creative and brilliant minds of this house can find a place to design the menu. Yeah. I've told this many times, but when my kids want to go out to eat with me, I'm thrilled to spend time with them. But ultimately, they decide where we go, and I end up paying for it. 
And I think the church has to have that mentality. They're not going to do my music up here. My music is amazing, but it's not the music that connects to them. So we're going to do music that connects to them. And I'm going to love the word and worship Jesus and learn the words to all the new songs and not resent it. Okay? Because it's my job to determine direction and it's my job to facilitate a place for relationship with them and they can determine style and they can determine something on the menu, but ultimately I'm going to pay for it. And I'm not going to take, you know, they're not going to get me somewhere I'm not willing to go. Like I'm not going to pay for, you know, a soup restaurant. Soup is not food. I'm not doing that. So um, ultimately, there's, there's some stipulations involved there. But I'm just saying, we should care enough about building rooms for training, seats for development, a place for the future that people have a chance to be a part of God's house. Psalm 68 and 5. It says, he'll be a father to the fatherless. He'll be a protector of widows. Is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Like, I believe that's a picture of what the church should be. So uh, a lot of people will be and act like having church foyers is not spiritual and having a cup of coffee, like a coffee bar and free coffee is not spiritual. It's not about that as a Holy Spirit substitute, you crazy fools. Ugh, that shouldn't have said that, but I feel it. Like, we're trying to create an environment where people are just willing to drop their guard and be available to relationship. And so we're going to build. And if you notice, this, this is a super cool coffee shop chair that I've got here. Let's see if this one will work. This may be where the it breaks down right here. Yeah, this isn't going to work. But look at this. This is a chair for community. Like, you know why we have foyers? So people don't run to their cars and not know anybody. We have lobbies so that people can linger. We have lobby lizards and we love it. <laughs> we do the coffee not because of anything more than it gives somebody like a shield for their first time to be like, I'm okay, stay away from me, I'm okay, I'm having a good time. People use coffee cups like shields. It's, it's, it's to build community spaces. It's to build lobbies. It's to build coffee bars so that people feel like I, 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 I can maybe make some friends here. I can maybe know somebody here. And church is for everybody. It's for people that feel like they're too bad to come to church. People who feel like the roof will cave in or the place will burn down if they come to church. Like, like you may be super anxious and and, 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 and unsure, listen, the doors swing wide for everybody. For anybody that's hurting, isolated, lonely, or just lost. Like, and I, I can't wait to say for people, you know, you're, welcome home. I'm glad you're here, right? And so the Bible tells us that God sits in some places. Like Psalm 23 and 3, it says, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. God, God inhabits the praises of his people. The Bible says in Matthew 18, 20, where there are two or three gathered in my name, there I am among them. The fourth place God sits, he sits with the, the children. He sits with the leaders. He sits with those that are in community. We're building a place for children. We're building a place for leaders. We're building a place for community. And the last place that we're going to talk about today is the church. I can't lift this one very high, but this is a church chair, okay? I love church chairs. I remember when we took out the pews and put in church chairs. It felt like we, had, we were just uptown. The church grew by 20% just because people had to put their butt in a specific seat. It was amazing. And uh, if you go somewhere and you see one of these chairs, just know somebody stole it from the church. <laughs> Turn it upside down, and if it says courageous, bring it here and there'll be a $5 bounty on it. I'll give it back to you. <laughs> this is a church chair. They hook together, and we put these in the house of God because things happen in God's house that don't happen anywhere else. God sits, and God shows up where his people are gathered. When we gather to worship, God comes in. The Bible says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am among them. There's a unique expression of God's presence when we gather together and worship. 
That's why it's not good for you to say, oh, I get so ticked off. I'm, I'm getting old and crusty. I'm clapping back at a lot of influencers. I saw a guy say, oh, a lot of people like to go to church, but I like to go to the mountains. And I said, I just, I just I had to punch him. And I don't even know the guy. I just wanted to punch him in the gut. And I typed in, I said, good for a weekend, bad for a life. Pow! God, it felt good. Good for a weekend, bad for a life. I'm, I'm coming off a little... You, many of you are snarling at me like I'm angry. I'm not angry. I just think it's bad to live your life in a way that you think the church is, the mountains is your church. The church is the called out ones. The church is the body of Christ. The church is God's design. No man designed the church. God designed the church. And when we gather to receive the ministry of the word by faith, God is present. And where people sit and worship, God comes in and sits in power. And so we're building a place for children. We're building a place for leaders to be developed. We're building a place for community. And we're building a place where God's presence dwells. Seat by seat, room by room, we're going to build God's house. God has put it in my heart that we would build five churches in my lifetime. If God would give grace, it has to be his grace. North, south, east, west, Christian County. North and south are built. And on days when it's not Arctic cold, mostly full. But we're going to the east side and we're going to build. And this may be the only time we build. It's not my desire to build. It's my desire to, I don't know if y'all remember it, but on Carney Street, they built the Popeyes. And it was not the Popeyes that's on Carney Street now on the north side. It, it was mismanaged and it went under. And so they built that, that Popeyes. And uh, when they went under, somebody came in and put a daycare in the Popeyes. <laughs> I'm not making this up. They made the Popeyes a daycare no idea how you would turn a Popeye's into a daycare but they did and then it went under and Hong Kong Inn on, on, on Kearney bought it and they've made it go and it thrives and it's if not for my gluten free lifestyle I would be hammering the wonderful wonderful offerings of Hong Kong Inn the Springfield Institution but alas I'm gluten free so I have to pay three times as much at Leong's down on the south side God's a miracle working God. So it's our desire to buy old Popeyes that have failed daycares and turn those into churches. It's much cheaper, much easier to do. But if God doesn't honor that and open that door, we'll do what he tells us to do. And this one he has ordered us to build on the east side. And so I have put, and this is something that we're going to do as a church. I put this legacy commitment card on your pew today, on your seat today. Dated myself with pew. And uh, there's three things I need you to do, okay? Here's where we're at as a church. We have planned and prepared. We have the funding to build the church. What we don't have the money for are the chairs, the F, F, and E, the furniture, fixtures, and equipment, okay? That will be somewhere between $1.4 and $1.6 million, okay? Now, I'm not asking one person to do it, but if one person wants to write a million-dollar check, million is spelled with two L's, M I L L. I O N, and we will be glad to give you a tax deductible contribution for that and use it for the work of God. And there's people that could, and there are people that might. But it will be all of us that make a commitment to build the house of God, okay? And so the first thing I want you to do is pray. This is spiritual work, and it has taken longer and it's more difficult to do things for the kingdom of God than it is to maybe open an insurance store, insurance company. There's spiritual adversity. We've been fighting through it. God's been giving us victory. Second thing I need you to do, if you're not tithing, I need everybody in the house to practice a higher level of obedience and tithe. Tithe is the first 10% of your income unto God. And it's something all Christians have done for generations of time. And it's something that those who are believers must do to honor God. The third thing is we need to give generously, which is to commit to invest and give beyond your tithe. And so I'm asking for something that we haven't asked for before, and I've told you what it's for. It's for the sound system. It's for the furniture, the fixtures, and the uh, equipment that will go into a church to build the, the south side. Now, that was in 2016, but the sound system cost us 580000 and all of the 
all of the furniture, fixtures, goldfish, toilet paper, mop heads, mop buckets, all the things. We have a list of it. We know what it is. That was about $480,000, okay? Now, I am saying for us, it's not equal gifts, it's equal sacrifices. So I'm asking for a one-year commitment from the church. I want you to pray about it. And I want you to make a commitment to God. And it's not fair to say I've only got 50 bucks because that is not true. You've lied on God. Every one of us can sacrifice. I'm sacrificing. We're all sacrificing to build the kingdom of God. The North Church paid for the South Church. The North and South Church are gathering their resources and paying for the East Church. The North Church has benefited from the South Church. And the South Church benefits from the North Church. There have been times in the South Church we didn't have leaders for a certain role, but we had somebody ready at North, and they went down there, and it benefited the South Church. It is one church working together to share Christ in our community. And so right now, we're going to pray over this. I'm going to ask you today or over the next few weeks to put one of these in the bucket and let me know that I can count on you for the next year to build a place for children, a place for developing leaders, a place for community, and a place for God's spirit to sit. Would you do that with me? Yes. Heavenly Father, 